All right, we'll get started. Thank you all for attending today for our RHEL seminar. And I'm very pleased to introduce today our speaker, Phil Klotzbach from the Colorado State University. He's a senior research scientist there. His history is, uh, well, we went to grad school together back at CSU. Uh, he got his PhD there in 2007 under Bill Gray, a great hurricane scientist. And uh, prior to that came to us from Massachusetts at Bridgewater State University. And uh, is well known for his uh, reports that he does each year on the seasonal forecast for the Atlantic hurricanes and how many are expected and so forth. And so that's really advanced a lot probably through his career. And uh, it's exciting to watch that evolve over the years. He took over from Bill Gray and what was it, 2005 or six? Yeah. And so uh, does a lot of other work as well, has over 100 peer-reviewed research papers on topics uh, covering all aspects of hurricanes. And I don't know any other person that knows every single detail about every hurricane for the last probably more than 50 years yeah. than, than Phil. So if you ever want to test, test his knowledge, give him, a, give him a challenge. Anyway, I'll let you take over. Well, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for coming. And um, yeah, I know, especially in uh, June, um, so we're going to talk about the outlook for the 2024 season. I'll talk a little bit um, about what we actually may be seeing coming down the pike um, even in the next week or so. Uh, just on phone was checking the latest EC operational model run and has a Cat 3 hurricane in the Yucatan in 10 days. Um, so definitely, it's definitely picking up, um, which is kind of unfortunately what we expected because if you know your hurricane climatology, June is really early to be getting stuff in the main development region. That's not usually a very good sign, or it is a good sign if you like hurricanes. Um, so our forecast for 2024, so our group at CSU has been doing seasonal hurricane forecasts since 1984. This is year number 41 of doing these things. Uh, I'd like to think we've learned a couple of things during that time, but we'll talk about the forecast, how we go about doing these forecasts, um, and talk about some questions um, as we go along. So we're forecasting a very active season. This, this is the most aggressive forecast we've ever put out with the June outlook. Oh, we've had more storms in this, but we had not forecast uh, this level of activity. Uh, so we're forecasting 23 storms, those are in the tropical storms and hurricanes, 11 of those becoming hurricanes and five becoming major category three, four, five hurricanes. You can see how that compares with uh, the 30 year average that NOAA uses, which for now is 91 to 2020, well above average season. Uh, we also forecast a couple of integrated metrics, one of which is accumulated cyclone energy. That's an integrated metric accounting for storm frequency intensity and duration. So if you're a baseball fan, you can think of it as kind of like the OPS of hurricanes. Uh, we also forecast ACE in the western half of the basin. Why? Because that's where everybody lives. So if you've got wind energy in the western half of the basin, I call that angst ACE. They're flying planes into it. People are not happy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. That's a new metric that we're forecasting. Uh, we started forecasting that last year. Uh, but when it comes to seasonal forecasts, I like showing this cartoon because, first of all, it has Dr. Gray in it, uh, showing verily I see 17 named storms, you know. That's the way a lot of people think that uh, we do these seasonal forecasts. Uh, I've also uh, said that, you know, my, my parents named me after the groundhog, Punxsutawney Phil, so I wake up in the morning, look and see if we see our shadow, and we forecast our hurricanes from that. Uh, but that's not how we do these seasonal forecasts. The way these seasonal forecasts got going was Dr. Gray was teaching tropical meteorology in the early 1980s. And he was kind of Wikipedia before there was Wikipedia, back in the day when he was Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so basically, he knew which years in the past were active hurricane seasons, and he knew which years in the past were El Nino years, and he said, huh, when we have El Nino in the tropical Pacific, we get fewer hurricanes in the Atlantic. And that made him scratch his head because El Nino occurs in the Pacific Ocean. Why on earth would it impact hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean thousands of miles away? And I'm sure we're all very familiar with the schematics of what El Nino and La Nina look like, but why we care about it in the tropical, what goes on in the tropical Pacific for what happens in the Atlantic is how it alters the walker circulation, which basically is your deep tropical circulation. So thunderstorms like the form of where the ocean water temperatures are the warmest. So in neutral or especially in La Nina conditions, that tends to be near the maritime continent. In El Nino, you get warmer water farther to the east. In response, those thunderstorms shift farther to the east as well. So if we look at the anomalous circulation in an El Nino, you get more upward motion in the central Pacific. At upper levels, you get that upper level divergence, increases upper level westerly winds into the Atlantic, also enhanced low level trade winds. 
Now, if we think to our Atlantic, tropical Atlantic climatology, our winds low near the ocean surface are the trades. So those trades become a bit stronger. You also really increase those upper level westerly winds, tending to increase your vertical wind shear, which tears apart hurricanes. So in general, El Nino is quieter hurricane seasons, while La Nina reduces your shear more active seasons. That's what made 2023 such a crazy season. We had record low vertical wind shear in a strong El Nino. If Dr. Gray were still alive, he would have been extremely impressed to see that happen. We have a paper that's almost accepted in BAMS, where we'll go into a lot of detail talking about the 2023 hurricane season. Hoping to get that accepted soon because I think we're going to need a paper on 2024, um, probably at the end of this year. Either one, the crazy busy season that we expected, or how the heck did we get it all so badly. Um, so how good are these seasonal forecasts? Uh, so here is a look at the track record of these predictions, looking at correlation skill. And obviously our models have changed with time. We're not using the same approach that Dr. Gray was using in the early 1980s. We have these wonderful reanalysis products, these globally gridded products that have really helped improve the skill of the forecasts. I really want to give a shout out to ERA5, uh, which is really helpful for us because in the past we built the model off to say the ERA interim reanalysis, which is great, but that was not available in real time. So we had to estimate it off of another reanalysis and some of those other reanalysis products aren't that great. So now we can use ERA-5 and you have those data almost up to real time. So that in and of itself has improved the skill of the forecasts. Also, as these reanalysis products have improved, we have a better idea of what's going on now as well as what occurred in the past. Another big thing that we have now that Dr. Gray didn't have in the 80s and even frankly 15 years ago, we didn't have that was very good is climate models. And these aren't, you know, this isn't like, um, you know, 50, 100 year simulations. This is seasonal forecast from climate models. They can do a reasonably good job of forecasting the uh, ocean temperatures, wind shears, the things that we care about for the hurricane season. And so for last year, you know, the prevailing wisdom was in a strong El Nino that dominates over anything else. But when we looked at the forecast last year from these climate models, they were saying strong El Nino, record warm Atlantic, and low shear. So we said, okay, these models should be able to, if they get their basic physics right, be able to tell us the shear patterns, and it actually worked out quite well. So I would say that the model climate models definitely helped us be able to correctly forecast an above average season last year. Um, so hopefully with time, the forecast skill of these models will continue to improve. Um, so here's what we're looking at. Oh, we're going to focus a lot on sea surface temperatures because the oceans give you have, have a fair amount of memory, so it can help kind of drive the large scale um, atmospheric circulation on these long time scales. So we're going to start by focusing on the uh, Nino 3.4 region, which is denoted by that blue rectangle. Uh, that's what happens when you let scientists name things. We come up with fun names like Nino 3.4. Uh, but basically, that's the region that NOAA uses to monitor El Nino and La Nina. So when water temperatures in that box persist at half a degree Celsius or more warmer than normal, and El Nino, half a degree Celsius, colder than normal or colder than that, it's a La Nina. Right now it's neutral, uh, but you also will see, holy cow, the Atlantic is hot, really, really hot. And it's been at or near record warm across that main development region, so named because it's the main region where hurricanes form. Um, it's been at or near record warm levels for over a year now, and that unfortunately has persisted. It's anomalously cooled slightly, but we're still running ahead of, say, last year, which is the prior record holder for the warmest Atlantic on record. Um, and so what I want to talk about in the next couple minutes is We'll talk a little bit about uh, what we think is going to happen with La Nina, and then we'll focus more on the Atlantic. And so the tropical Pacific, we look at the ocean temperatures, but you also want to know what's going on beneath the ocean surface. So here we're looking at subsurface ocean heat content. So this is the top 300 meters of the ocean. So you can see here the subsurface has been is quite cold. You know, it's not super cold. You're averaging about half a degree Celsius colder than normal when you average across the eastern and central tropical Pacific. Um, but I'd say with the wind patterns coming up, which we'll see shortly, uh, I'd say that certainly still does look like we're probably going to be moving over towards La Nina for the peak of the season. Frankly, given how warm the Atlantic is, whether we officially meet the La Nina standard or we're on the cool side of neutral probably doesn't really matter all that much. Um, so El Nino has dissipated. NOAA declared it over a couple of weeks ago. So right now, NOAA gives a 75% chance of La Nina for the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season, a nominal 1% chance of El Nino. Um, like I said, whether we officially go over to El, uh, La Nina or not, I don't think necessarily really matters a ton. Um, if we look at the forecast, this is a Hobmuller plot, so time starting at the top of the y-axis going down 
uh, with time. Here, blues are anomalous easterlies, reds are anomalous westerlies. Uh, those two horizontal lines, or sorry, two vertical lines, denoting kind of the central Pacific. You can see there's a whole lot of blue and green, so we're gonna have very strong trade winds coming up. Those strong trades will induce anomalous eastern currents out of the east, likely also increasing levels of upwelling, probably helping us push us towards a more La Nina-like state. We have had some kind of pernicious anomalous warmth in the central tropical Pacific, but I suspect these strong trades will help to kind of get rid of that over the next few weeks. Um, if we look at the North Atlantic, we still have record warm sea surface temperature anomalies across the tropical Atlantic. These have backed off a bit over the last couple of weeks. We've had atmospheric circulation pattern associated with a more positive phase of the North Atlantic oscillation that has brought some anomalously cooler water down along the west coast of the west coast of Europe down into northern part of Africa. But if we look at the current sea surface temperature pattern and we look at kind of the optimal pattern that's associated with busy hurricane seasons, it's a pretty close to a perfect match. Uh, we have again lost a bit of that anomalous warmth right off the Iberian Peninsula. Um, that's something we're obviously gonna be monitoring quite closely. Why I think that matters, because obviously we don't have a lot of hurricanes off the coast of Portugal, is if we get those sea surface temperatures warm in June, that tends to force lower pressures, reducing the strength of your subtropical high. When you have a weaker subtropical high, you get weaker trades in response that lead to anomalous warming. In general, the subtropical ridge in the Atlantic has been extremely weak for about a year now. It's been much, much weaker than normal. That's what kicked off this whole mess, getting the Atlantic so warm starting last spring. And it's just basically persisted. In our paper looking at last year, we did a four month average of the sea, surf or the sea level pressure anomalies. And there was like a five millibar bullseye of lower than normal pressure over a four month average, which is a lot for a four month average in the subtropical ridge. So it just disappeared and it hasn't really rebuilt. Um, in addition to the ocean surface temperatures, we know there's a lot of ocean, basically a lot of juice in the ocean. So we're looking at the ocean heat content, uh, June 25th, um, so on the far left is 2024, the red, the dark red line, the lighter red line is 2023, which is the prior record holder. Uh, this ocean heat content data is from 2013 onwards. So it's not the whole realm of things, but you can see even from this, the last 10, 11 years have generally been pretty warm. So we're running about in late June, we're running normally what we get. The blue line is climatology about what we should get around the start of September. Um, so that's not great. Um, and also we're actually now have higher ocean heat content today than we ever did in 2018, um, which still had a couple of rather interesting hurricanes. Um, so just kind of highlighting, we are running well ahead of schedule. So I tell people, you know, it's hard to know exactly, are we going to go all the way to 2023? Who knows? But, you know, the die is somewhat cast that we are going to have above, well above normal ocean heat content because that line is not going to be coming down in the next few months. Um, it's a little bit tricky, but I do think in general, the trade winds coming up are going to be somewhat weaker than normal, especially in the Western part of the basin. Um, so especially in the Caribbean Sea. And unfortunately, if we look at this pattern here, you see basically reds in the deep tropics, blues to the north. That's just a whole lot of low level horizontal vorticity. So basically just a whole broad area of spin in the Caribbean for the foreseeable future. So, you know, I think really we are going to be looking at probably, you know, stuff really kicking off here soon. And it really doesn't look like there's a ton of an end in sight. Obviously, there's a lot of subseasonal variability that may come in. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we move ahead here. Um, but, you know, I've done a lot of presentations this year, and people always want to know, you know, okay, you say a busy season, but where are the storms going to hit? And obviously, there's only so much we can say, uh, you know, months in advance. Uh, there's a few things we can look at. We can look at precipitation forecasts. This is the August through October precipitation forecast from the European Center. So here, greens indicate high probabilities of above normal precip. Browns indicate high probabilities of below normal precip. In the tropics, you can kind of use that where you have hurricanes as somewhat of a proxy of maybe tropical cyclone activity. You see a lot of green in the western part of the Atlantic, which isn't great. Last year, the model actually did a surprisingly good job of highlighting a bullseye of green and then more of a recurving track, which is what we saw last year. Busy season, but fortunately most of the stuff recurved. Um, ECMWF also puts out tropical cyclone track density, so here, Orange is, is basically average, reds is above, blues is below. I wouldn't put a ton of stock in all this stuff, but you do see there is more of a shift towards the west than there say would have been last year. But again, 
track density forecasts months in advance are, you know, are going to have very limited skill because you have to, one, know the steering, but also obviously know where these storms are forming. Obviously, if you get storms forming, to me, I always say like one of the worst places to get storms is like 10 north, 50 west, because they're too low latitude to recurve before they hit something. So, you know, for, for example, even the system at NHC just had, went up to a medium chance with, probably potentially going to form in an area where probably not, isn't going to be great for likely causing some impacts just because the odds of it recurving before it um, would hit somebody is pretty low. We also use analogs, which involves going back into the past and looking for years in the past as conditions most similar to what we currently see and what we expect to see for the peak of the season. And when we look at analogs, obviously, if you were to have five or 10 people in this hurricane business go and pick analogs, we probably would pick slightly different years. So what we tried to find here were years that were going from El Nino to La Nina, like we had this past year. We also were looking for years that had relatively warm Atlantics. Obviously, right now we're warming at the warmest on record, so we don't have a great analog for that because it's the warmest on record. The closest candidate we have for that would be last year, which obviously was a strong El Nino, so that doesn't fit. But the years we selected were actually um, six years, 1878, so that's going way, way back in the record books. Uh, it's pretty good observational evidence that 1877 was a strong El Nino, 1878 likely transitioned to La Nina. Um, allegedly, the Atlantic was super hot that year. Obviously, the data back then is fairly questionable. 1926, 1998, 2005, 2010, and 2020. Um, so here, NS is for named storms, H is for hurricanes, MH is for major hurricanes, and the Ds are just the number of days that you had those. Um, it's important to realize that 1878, 1926, we weren't flying planes in the storms. We had no satellites. So the name storms were likely somewhat underestimated in those years because we just didn't really have much in the way of observations in the eastern half of the basin. But our forecast is, you know, for a very robust season, close to the average of our analogs. But one thing I obviously want to point out is, you know, our last three analogs, 2005, 2010, and 2020. 2005 and 2020, tons of impacts, huge problems. 2010, great year. 12 hurricanes, great for studying hurricanes, but not one hit the United States. Um, and really not a ton of impacts anywhere. There were some in the Caribbean, significant impacts up in Newfoundland with Igor. But otherwise, you know, given how much storm activity was out there, it was a quote unquote good year and that most of the storms stayed away. So that's obviously some of the uncertainty that we do have is that we don't know exactly where these storms are going to form and exactly where they're going to go. I'll talk a little bit more about how we can shade this a little bit um, as we talk about the ACE in the western half of the basin and how we forecast that. So when we do our seasonal forecasts, um, there is uncertainty, right? We know there's uncertainty with these forecasts. When we put out the forecast, we give you our best estimate because if you give a range, I've seen time and time again the media report, Say we forecast nine to 14 hurricanes. The media says up to 14 hurricanes, which then the general public says, okay, they're forecasting 14 hurricanes. Or at least if you tell them 11, hey, that's our best estimate. But we know there's uncertainty. So we've basically taken the um, historical errors of our statistical models and fit them to statistical distribution. And you can cut these uncertainty ranges. And you see these uncertainty ranges are pretty similar to say what you would see with NOAA. Um, so it's like plus or minus three-ish hurricanes in April and June, plus or minus two by the time you get to August, because you're closer to the events you're trying to predict, the confidence goes up. Um, but you can see there is still a fair amount of spread. Again, we'll update this forecast in July and in early August, and the spread shrinks because generally those forecasts have more skill because we're closer to the events we're trying to predict. And the nice thing with the Atlantic hurricane season is that usually while it starts June 1st, usually June and July are pretty quiet. July gives us a ton of really useful information. There's a ton of predictability once you know what July is. Um, so it gives us one last shot to kind of fine tune the numbers in August, or it gives us one last shot at a mulligan if we realize we really had messed stuff up into that point. So we also forecast ACE west of 60. Now there's not a ton we can say, um, but in general, you do get a bit more of your basin wide ACE in the western half of the basin in La Nina relative to El Nino. The biggest reason being that in La Nina years, the Caribbean becomes a lot more conducive. And if you get storms in the western, in the Caribbean, that's all west of 60. So that can increase your percentage of ACE in that part. Also, it's a very weak signal, but the subtropical high does tend to eventually rebuild a little bit in La Nina's, tending to push the storms a little bit farther west. But it's a very weak signal. Everybody wants to know what's the steering flow going to be like, what's the Bermuda high going to be like. But if you look at it day by day, week by week, it shifts a lot. Um, and a lot of it more is not only how is that 
Bermuda High is shaping up or whatever, but also how the storms are tracking. If you have storms forming in the western part of the basin, that can obviously pose problematic. Ideally, in a year like this year, we want everything forming right off of Africa, because if they form off Africa and get strong right off of Africa, usually the beta effect pulls them a bit farther to the north, and they're more likely to recurve and just be fish storms, as opposed to if they form a little bit farther west, then they tend to go more with the trade wind flow, stay at low latitudes, and that's when you get your real big problems. Not that you can't get storms forming off Africa and going all the way across like an Irma or an Ivan. They're just a lot rarer. Um, you have to have a really big ridge to basically drive them further to the west. So we also do probabilities of landfall. Now, we're not going to forecast, you know, a hurricane hitting Houston or something like that, but we can... You can calculate historical probabilities, and then what we do is we basically adjust them based on our forecast for the ace west of 60. So since we're forecasting above normal ace west of 60, these probabilities are elevated. So we have probabilities for various regions, parts of the U.S. coastline, the Caribbean, and then we also do these probabilities for every county along the coast from Texas to Maine, parishes of Louisiana, um, as well as the coastal provinces of eastern Canada, every country in Central America, as well as the Caribbean, as well as the coastal states on the Atlantic side of Mexico. And the way that we do these probabilities is we select the storms that are within 50 miles of each county. And the reason we use 50 miles is if you go and focus on landfalls, you obviously reduce your sample size, and then you'll get examples where, okay, no hurricanes hit this county, but three hurricanes hit the county next door. And, you know, that's probably effectively just dumb luck. And obviously, if there's a hurricane 50 miles from your county, you're going to be not having a great day uh, in general. So we expanded the radius to 50 miles, um, and that kind of helps smooth out the distribution a bit. So here we're looking at Plymouth County, which is the county I grew up on, and that will become important later why I'm focusing on Massachusetts. Um, but we can see there's been um, 10 hurricanes that have been within 50 miles of Plymouth County over the 141-year period. So you can convert that into a probability and then, again, adjust them by the latest forecast. So here are just a few examples for various states. If you go on our website, we have all the counties and provinces and, um, and parishes as well. Um, so you can see the probability for her Florida is going to be the highest because the climatological probability is the highest. Obviously, what I do stress is that you know, if a hurricane makes landfall, say, near Miami, maybe up in Pensacola, they won't have any impacts from it. Whereas, obviously, if a hurricane, say, makes landfall near Biloxi, the entire coastline of Mississippi is going to be feeling some impacts because the Mississippi coastline is small. But we figured hopefully most people know what state they're in. Um, maybe there's a few people wandering on Boulder who don't. But every now and then we should know what state we're in. All right. Um, so now we talk about our seasonal forecast. Uh, we do update it on the 9th of July, a final update on the 6th of August. And then we do a, uh, a verification at the end of November where we talk about did the forecast verify well? What happened? How did it play out? And often these will actually end up leading to eventually uh, peer-reviewed journal articles on the hurricane seasons because we want to try to really kind of understand what happened. And then we're also obviously always working on trying to improve our methodologies, taking into account the latest forecast modeling uh, techniques. Um, when it comes to seasonal forecasts, so we're not the only show in town. So in 1984, CSU was it, but now, you know, we've got a lot of competition. Um, so this website is seasonalhurricanepredictions.org. It's a website that our group uh, co-founded with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, who hosts the website, with some funding from AXA XL. So we have about 30 different groups submitting seasonal hurricane forecasts. These include private sector weather companies, government agencies, as well as universities. Now, there are actually more seasonal hurricane forecasts coming from landlocked states than from states that actually bordered an ocean. So take that as you will. Uh, we got, even got two in Colorado, a CSU and CU. Um, but we also have a lot of private sector weather companies. So when we started this website in 2016, I would say I was probably aware about half of these groups doing seasonal forecasts. There's a lot of here that I had no idea were actually doing these forecasts. Um, so if you go to the website, there's information on all the different groups, the methodologies they use. And then what we do is we have their forecast displayed. So if the forecast is one number, it's displayed as a dot. If it's a range, it's displayed as a line. Um, and they're color coded. So greens are, um, let's see, greens are universities. Blues are government agencies, and purples are private sector weather companies. On the y-axis, the orange dot is all the average of all of the forecasts, which is for 11, which happens to be what we're forecasting at CSU. And the red dot is the observed value to date, which is zero. Hopefully, we can keep that at zero. I'm not sure how much longer, but at least for now, that's uh, the way things are looking. Um, and these website, basically, um, we chase people to make sure that they're updating their forecast to the website uh, when they come out. So this is 
as best we know, this is all the different groups that have currently submitted forecasts. Um, I think everyone is up to date at this point. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about some sub-seasonal stuff since now we're in the heart of the season and I think there's actually some really interesting stuff potentially coming down the pike. So these are zonal wind shear anomalies. So the left column is the observed and the right-hand column is the forecast from the ECMWF. This is zonal shear. So the Atlantic in general is westerly shear dominant. So blues, easterly shear anomalies basically usually mean reductions in shear. So if we look south of 20, there's a whole lot of blue. Um, there's a little bit of a tut just east of the islands right now, but that looks to recede. And one of the other things that we do see is that we're going to be getting a lot more um, easterly shear coming up over the... Uh, over Africa coming up, and that indicates a stronger tropical easterly jet, which is likely to invigorate the African monsoon as well. So I suspect with time, we're going to continue to see, you know, robust chances for storm activity. Um, this is this morning's ECMWF ensemble. Now that is really impressive for late June. This is like what you would normally expect to see in September. Um, so there's basically, there's a system right now that's in the Caribbean that the Hurricane Center is monitoring. Um, and that um, is the, some of the tracks in the far western part of the basin. And then there's actually two waves, uh, two tropical waves. There's one that currently NHC has a 40% chance on, another one they haven't put on a tropical weather outlook on yet. But between those two systems, definitely, you know, there's a chance of one or even both of those forming. So, you know, and a lot of these tracks aren't great either. So again, this is all ensemble world. This isn't guarantees anything's going to happen. But certainly for late June, this is, this is looking healthy. Um, and if we look at the forecast animation of vertical wind shear, so here blues are redu reductions in shear. And we look at the, kind of that main development region. The shear is much lower than normal. Now, climatologically, shear this time of year is still fairly high. So there's a lot of 10 to 15, 20 knots of shear around. So that can obviously still be enough to knock down stuff. But you can see even that kind of that tut near the Caribbean is forecast to basically lift out, be replaced by much lower shear. So I'd say right now, you know, the all systems are probably go to potentially get some fairly robust early season storm activity. Now, if we dive into MJO world, um, this is... <laughs> Messy at best. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of you looked at like these Wheeler Hendon phase space diagrams. So the Madden Julian oscillation can be a big driver of hurricane activity globally um, on a sub seasonal scale because it mod basically modulates convection in the equatorial regions. Um, so there is some hints that maybe the MJO will amplify a bit and will start to shift more towards increasing convection in the maritime continent, maybe into the Western Pacific. If that were the case, that would tend to maybe stifle the Atlantic hurricane season, at least temporarily. One of the things I really like to look at is velocity potentials. And really, um, if you want busy Atlantic, you want to see air going up over Africa and the Indian Ocean because you get upper level divergence and you get upper level easterly winds, which reduces your shear. And you want to see subsident motion in the tropical Pacific. And so broadly speaking, in general, yes, um, the signal kind of looks to break down maybe the middle of July, which is potentially a sign of that MJO beginning to propagate. But overall, you see a lot. If you'd basically go 60 east, which is, you know, basically right off the, right off the east coast of Africa, there's almost green the whole way, which is a sign of probably overall pretty favorable conditions for the Atlantic for the foreseeable future. So... I think right now all systems appear to still be go for a very, very busy hurricane season. Our forecast, our next forecast will come out on July 9th. Starting on August the 6th, our group also does two-week forecasts. So we put out a forecast August 6th and every two weeks following where we talk about activity the next two weeks. So talk kind of about what I've talked about the last few minutes, where we go into identifying potential regions for formation and looking at, say, like what the shears and what the MJO propagation is looking like on shorter term timescales. The reason we do that is because you can have a banana season that has quiet periods or you can have a pretty quiet season that has a really busy period. And I would say last year, one thing we were, that I was happy with is we put out a season, um, a two week forecast on August the 18th. And at that point, we said, yes, the Atlantic looks busy, but in about 10, 11 days, it looks like there may be something forming in the Northern Caribbean, Northwest Caribbean, Southern Gulf of Mexico. And that's something we really want to be, you know, that's not a great region for storms to form. Definitely pay attention for that. And that actually was what became Idalia, which was the most impactful storm of the year. So on a seasonal time scale, there's only so much we can tell you about impacts. When you get to the two week time scale, you know, we can start doing stuff like this where we're looking at an ensemble and saying, okay, you know, might be something I want to be paying attention to. Now, 
I'm a lot more interested in this area now than say I would have a week ago when there wasn't much signal there. So again, just kind of highlighting how the degree of confidence and the degree of ability for impacts becomes higher as you get closer to the events you're trying to predict. Um, so I guess I can take a couple questions now, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about um, another project that I've been uh, that I'm quite passionate about, which is uh, how we categorize hurricanes. But if anyone has questions on the uh, seasonal stuff, I'm happy to uh, talk about that now. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, using climate models. Were you referring to CFS? No. <laughs> um, so we use the ECMWF, the UK Met Office, and uh, JMA, um, and a research model CMCC out of Italy. Those are the ones that we found with our seasonal forecast that actually give us the highest levels of skill. Um, CFS, as you might guess, lags pretty far behind the rest of them just because it hasn't been updated in so long. Um, it just struggles. Um, so um, in general, the models often say fairly similar things. They're not purely independent, but it is nice to have, um, have those dynamical models because it does kind of help when you get these kind of sea surface temperature configurations that we haven't seen before to basically be able to kind of pull out signals and look at things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to get if we haven't seen it before. Um, so with climate models, at least, you know, they should be able to tell you if they get the sea surface temperature, the boundary conditions, right, kind of how the wind should largely respond. Obviously, there's other stuff that goes into it too, but that has certainly been pretty helpful. And that's been something I think even the last five years, they've definitely improved. And the nice thing with these climate models is they have 25 to 40 year hindcasts that they've been developed. So they basically can see how good they are in the past, which is nice, because obviously otherwise I wouldn't know which one would be the best. But now you can kind of see. And we primarily use the ensemble average, but I think for next year we're actually going to also start using basically all the ensemble members so we can get, when we do it in a forecast mode, we can get, you know, have a statistical model that's built off of the climate models, but that has the spread of the different forecasts. And you can have instead of, you know, the model says 168, so it can say 110 to 250 or whatever. So you can kind of get a spread of the, so basically more and more models, uh, more and more data as these, I think basically to take more advantage of the climate models because then you actually just can get a better idea of maybe some of the uncertainty in the, in the forecast. Uh, yeah, one difference that popped out to me when you were showing the SST anomalies from like active seasons and the current one was the, the right off the coast of like the mid-Atlantic and the northeast is just super warm right now. Uh, does that matter at all? Does that influence any like tut activity or Rossby wave breaking or does it just there and the kind of main development region of the Atlantic doesn't care at all. Yeah, so we've, so unfortunately that the, the top predictability, <laughs> we had a, a student get a PhD kind of looking at some of this stuff. Like, so the, a lot of, most of the skill that we have for the shear forecast comes from the tropics. The mid latitude stuff is harder. <laughs> There's a weak relationship with basically if the sub, if the sub, if the subtropics are colder than normal and the tropics are really hot, that can kind of encourage more baroclinicity, more tuts. But again, it's, I'd love it if it was this great smoking gun signal, but it's not. Um, and I think it's mid-latitude weather in the summer is just really hard. It doesn't, the oceans don't drive it as much as, like in the tropics, the nice thing is the oceans kind of drive the bus, but in the mid-latitudes, not so much. Um, so there's a bit of something there, which is why I mentioned kind of like that cold water off Iberia. If that were to really get cold, that might be something we'd be, paying more attention to, but it does look like that tut, at least in the short term, is going to lift out. And it will come back. I mean, it does kind of come back and forth. In general, when you have a really hot Atlantic and a La Nina, that should really reduce the tut, but the tut has some of its own variability as well. And, you know, even we look back at a year like 2013, which was like the year that forecasters don't want to talk about because we forecast nine hurricanes and got two. Um, if you look at, people will blame it on the tut, but if you look at like actual tut indices, the tut was like dead on average. So, okay, yeah, Maybe we should have had seven hurricanes, but what about two? Like there was other stuff going on too. So there's, there's the, 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 the top predictability part I think is unfortunately fairly low on anything other than like a, maybe one to two weeks. You can kind of see, see it digging in and out. But in general, in I always kind of consider the Atlantic like the Eastern Atlantic, the shear is generally more favorable, Eastern and Central Atlantic. And then the Western Atlantic is kind of like high risk, high reward. The SSTs are hot. So if the tut's not there, bombs away. But if the tut's there, it can just get shredded. So it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's just kind of depends. In years where the tut isn't there, that's when stuff really kind of goes bombs away. But so there's the tropical predictability piece, which I think we have, but the middle attitude piece, which I think is still, unfortunately, not as much predictability as I would like to see. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I can dive in now and talk about something else that I'm very uh, fired up about, and that is how we categorize hurricanes. Um, so as you probably know, we categorize hurricanes by wind using the Sapphire simpson hurricane wind scale. We've been doing that since the early 1970s. Um, but I want to propose that we try to use something else to categorize hurricanes. And I'm not the first one to propose using something else. Um, this is work I've done with a bunch of colleagues. Um, and we've done a few different papers kind of looking at this. And, you know, I always go back to these two storms that now seems like yesterday, but now 20 years ago. Uh, Hurricane Charlie on the right, Hurricane Katrina on the left. Both very impactful storms. But if we look at the two storms, just from eyeballing them, you can see Katrina is a whole lot bigger. And you can kind of tell. So if Charlie was a four because it had stronger winds, Katrina was a three. But another important metric the Hurricane Center monitors in real time, and we measure very accurately, is pressure. And we know the reason we have winds is due to a gradient or difference in pressure. So in a storm like Charlie, where you have 150 mile an hour winds and a pressure of 941, that's a fairly high pressure for winds that strong, which means that gradient is spread out over a small area. It's a tight gradient, which means you have a small storm. Not that it can't have significant wind impacts, but small storms are going to overall have less storm surge and also just a smaller wind radii, smaller rainfall footprint. Um, so if we look at the damage from Charlie, certainly it was significant, but there wasn't a lot of surge damage. Whereas Katrina was a monstrous storm, absolutely enormous. Um, and so had a huge storm surge, about 28 feet associated with it. Obviously a ton of damage, even had the levees held. We saw over 150 fatalities in Mississippi, almost all from the storm surge. Um, and so after Katrina, there was a whole lot of angst about what the heck, how on earth could Katrina be a three on a one to five scale? The scale must be broken. And I would argue, yes, it is. But a lot of the scales that have been proposed are quite complicated. One, either stuff you can't do in real time, or two, they try to throw in rainfall, which is a whole other metric, and you can really, really confuse people. But I think with pressure, we have something we measure well, the models do a better job of forecasting than they do of wind, and is something that we can use to categorize hurricanes because it correlates better with, um, with damage. And I'll hopefully convince you of that. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, we used HERDAT2, uh, which is the historical hurricane data set, the extended best track for some of the wind radii, which I'll show a little bit later. Uh, we use normalized damage, which is the amount of damage that these historical hurricanes would be estimated to cause if they were to occur today. We use integrated kinetic energy, which is calculated from the extended best track. And then we use observed surge, which is U-surge, which is developed by Hal Needham, um, with some updates that he's put in uh, very recently. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But I really wanted to start by talking a little bit about normalized damage, which is the damage that these hurricanes of the past would likely cause if they were to make landfall today. And I'd like to go back to the 1926 Great Miami Hurricane. Category 4 hurricane slammed into downtown Miami. Uh, 145 mile an hour winds, pressure of 930. Um, powerful hurricane, caused about $75 million in damage in 1926. Uh, you can see some of the damage on that bottom panel. You can't read the bottom left, but that one, the hull on the ship says uh, Miami's new dry dock, courtesy of the hurricane of 1926. A lot of storm surge. $75 million in damage. But we know we can't just adjust it for inflation and say that's how much it would cost today because things are a little bit different in Miami today than they were in 1926. So here's a nice plot that one of my colleagues put together. This is looking at housing unit and population changes since 1900. 42 million more people living in coastal counties and 21 million housing units. So in insurance parlance, there's a big increase in exposure along the coast. Um, and you can see this even looking, uh, this is an animation of housing unit. Um, Oh, this, yeah, there we go. Yeah, you can see just how the density is just blowing up a lot. You see, especially in places like Florida, big increases in housing units along the coast. So we have these big growth and exposure along the coastline. And especially for Miami-Dade County, 100,000 people in Miami-Dade County in 1926. That's looking at Miami Beach, one hotel. Uh, here's the same image today, a little bit different now. Um, and I mean, this is actually probably not from 2024, maybe 2023. If you were to look today, there'd be even more high rises. I can tell you, they're still building down there. So we have a 27 fold increase in population. So this storm, if it were to make landfall today, is estimated to do about $200 billion in damage. Now, there's some debate as to exactly how much it would do today, given improvements in building codes. Most of the normalizations to date have not taken into account improvements in building codes. I'm actually working with some colleagues to try to do that. Um, so I think that will really, really help to kind of hopefully highlight how important building codes are. But using that normalized damage, we're now going to look at the relationships between wind, pressure, and damage. And so we're going to start by looking at all hurricanes that have hit the U.S., continental U.S., since 2005. But none hit in 2006, so we're going to start in 2007. 
Um, so this is a plot showing the relationship between wind and damage for all hurricanes from 07 to 2023. Here we're ranking the damage and we're ranking the winds because we're trying to eliminate huge outlying events like a Sandy or a Harvey that can just really skew the data. Um, one thing I do want to point out is we did include Sandy while officially post-tropical landfall was a hurricane until about two hours before landfall. and certainly was a case where the winds weren't any really good, were not a good indicator of how much damage potential that storm had. So we see there is a positive relationship. So as you would expect, stronger winds, more damage. But if we look at the same relationship with pressure, wow, that slope of that trend line is a lot better. Um, not perfect, but a significant improvement. Um, and all we know here is the strength of the storm when it made landfall. We know nothing about where it made landfall. I was a geography major as an undergrad, and I was told many times it's all about location, location, location. And obviously that's a huge driver of the damage. So if we look at these storms that are way off the trend line, you can see a storm like everybody's favorite storm to pronounce Isaias, um, way off the trend line because even though it made landfall in a fairly small or not a sparsely populated uh, county, went straight up the eastern seaboard, caused a lot of damage to major metropolitan areas. Also, it was pretty close to the coast, so it spun down, but not real quickly because it was still getting some energy from the ocean. And then we see Idalia is not really well on that line either, and that's because Idalia made landfall last year in Taylor County, population 21,000. So while it caused a lot of damage in Taylor County, it was about a $3.5 billion loss overall. If you put it right on the trend line, it had, quote unquote, should have been a $20 billion storm which would make sense had it made landfall in a more um, population dense area. But even without knowing location, you can still get a pretty pronounced relationship um, since 2007. And this is a uh, 28 land falling hurricanes. If we go back to 1900 using the normalized damage, we do see, again, the wind damage is there, pressure is better. And really, I think one of the big things, even if this relationship was the exact same, the correlations were the same. I still want to try to write some papers on this because we all know measuring wind in a hurricane is extremely hard. We can do it, but it's very messy, especially when you think about, you, have, you now have synthetic aperture radars, which is how you get an image like this, but there's still issues with that. Um, and obviously if you're flying a plane into a hurricane, we can measure the winds, but you know, we're a plane, we're flying in one place. We know approximately where the strongest wind should be to the, um, the front right-hand quadrant of the, to the storm motion vector, but not always. And you're flying through like this, you're trying to sample a swath. Did you really sample the strongest winds? How long does the one minute sustained wind need to be there to be truly representative of the one minute sustained wind? I've seen that discussion. You know, as my mentor Bill Gray would say, it becomes a can of worms. Uh, whereas pressure with an aircraft, it's pretty straightforward to measure. You can drop a sonde in the eye and measure the pressure pretty accurately from that. You can also use what they call the D value, which is basically your actual alt altimetric height versus, or what you're, what you're actually flying in versus what, the alt what your pressure height should have been, um, just given basically the um, um, thermal wind. Um, and so we have that, but also even when you get on land, um, the one minute max sustained wind is defined to be basically over ocean, so open exposure. So when you, a storm comes on land, that obviously does not exist. Um, and also to um, anemometers chronically fail in high wind environments, whereas barometers don't even need to be outside to accurately measure the pressure. And also in general, when you have storms making landfall, uh, storm chasers will go down for the landfalls and they will actually mount barometers, various places. So you can get really good barometric pressure readings near the point of landfall. If we look after the season, storms will sometimes get bumped up or down a category. With VMAX, they'll change the winds five, 10 knots. Pressure very rarely changes more than a millibar or two. So it becomes more consistent as well, because if you remember with Katrina, they kept the pressure the same, but they lowered the winds five knots, so they bumped it down from a four to a three. And that was a big um, issue when they did that. People were not happy. Um, and the main reason being, I don't think like uh, the late great grad Dangerfield would say like the hurricanes from Georgia to Maine don't get any respect. Um, and that's because these storms tend to be older. They've been around longer. So storms with time tend to grow in size. They go through these annual replacement cycles. So these Georgia to Maine hurricanes are older, they're sprawlier. So the changes in VMAX aren't necessarily super strong, but you have big differences in the pressure. So if you look at the relationship between wind and damage for Georgia to Maine, you know, you're not really giving people much useful information. That's a pretty messy uh, curve fit. Whereas if we look at pressure, it works a lot better. Not perfect, but it's a much better fit. So again, I think if we're gonna use the same scale around from Texas to Maine, let's use pressure because you're giving people, especially from Georgia to Maine, a much better idea of the potential impacts that those storms are going to cause. Because those storms may only have 75, 80 knot winds, they have a pressure of 960, be huge, and have a big storm surge associated with them.
So what we did next is we said, let's recategorize hurricanes by wind, or sorry, instead of wind, we're gonna categorize hurricanes by pressure, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't overhyping or underhyping storms. So we said, okay, let's set lifetime maximum intensities. So we look for say category threes, about 20% of all storms named by the National Hurricane Center become a major hurricane. About 20% have pressures of 960 or below. So you can see kind of how we assign the categories. We wanted to pick values rounded to the nearest five so people could remember them somewhat well. Obviously, you could fine tune those numbers if you wanted to a little bit to make those lifetime max intensities match up exactly. But if we look at the major hurricanes using the wind definition, here we're going back to 1999. Just if you go back much further, just get too many dots or too many hurricane symbols. Here the size of the hurricane symbol is proportional to the damage that the storm caused. Um, so if you look from Texas to Maine or Texas to Florida, that's where all your major hurricanes are. No major hurricanes north of Florida based on wind. Whereas if we do the same for pressure, we see several pop up along the eastern seaboard, most notably Sandy, but then several in North Carolina, including Floyd, uh, Floyd, Florence, Isabel, and Irene, and um, so we have several, and also Dorian in 2019 as well, popping up along the, um, along the coast of North Carolina. Um, so if we do that same categorization, Katrina, which was a three by wind, becomes a category five by pressure. And I think certainly given the storm surge and the overall impacts that that storm caused, uh, likely warranted that higher category. Likewise, if you're interested, Hurricane Maria would have been upgraded from a category four to a category five, because I believe its pressure was 919 when it came ashore in Puerto Rico. Um, so just in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to talk about some work that we've uh, been working on more recently. And this is looking at the relationship between storm surge and wind. And so you might kind of expect intuitively that we get a better relationship with pressure than we would with wind for storm surge. And here what we're looking at is the relationship between the maximum observed storm surge for every hurricane since 1950 using Hal Needham's U-Surge data set. And we're looking at the relationship between wind and surge. And we do see that there is a positive relationship, but that it's better with pressure. Um, and as you would expect, that makes sense because storm surge is related to the inverse barometer effect, but also obviously driven by the size of the storm and pressure correlates better with the size of the storm. And frankly, I think both of these relationships are actually pretty impressive because all we're looking at here is the max surge for each storm. So we know bathymetry is a huge driver of storm surge as well, but just looking at the pressure versus the surge, you can get a pretty accurate relationship here. Obviously there is some spread because obviously observe max storm surge. We probably didn't actually observe the max storm surge. Um, and obviously bathymetry is a huge, also a big driver, which would account for some of the spread uh, listed here. Um, but I wanted to kind of finish by looking a little bit at fatalities. Um, and so unfortunately this data set has not been updated since 2012. I don't like to show data that's this old, but from 63 to 2012, about half of all deaths were storm surge. Then we had a nice low or Unfortunately, people were still dying, but not from storm surge. But then Hurricane Ian, about 60% of the direct fatalities in Ian, unfortunately, were from storm surge. So storm surge is obviously still a big driver of fatalities in hurricanes. And we know also storm size, given a larger area being impacted, can also be, be a big driver of fatalities. So what we wanted to look at next is when we categorize hurricanes by wind, how well are we predicting the upper tercile of fatality? So these are upper tercile fatalities are those with 10 or more deaths since 1988. We started in 88, a bit arbitrary, but basically because we wanted to make sure there was a kind of a modern warning system. Obviously the further back you go, you may have more deaths just because the warning systems weren't as good. Um, and if we look at the number of hurricanes categorized as major for the upper fatalities, we see more categorized by pressure than by wind. Again, kind of highlighting how well this can get at the impacts. Um, obviously, we know rainfall can be a huge impact as well. I think rainfall really needs to be treated separately just because pressure is still kind of getting at an integrated intensity metric of the storm, whereas rainfall is basically something I think that really needs to be treated kind of on its own. Pressure will correlate a little bit better with some of the rainfall metrics, just given the size, so we'll have a better indicator of the rainfall footprint. Maybe um, with the max rainfall total, it gets pretty messy because obviously max rainfall is a lot driven by translation speed, terrain impacts, all this other stuff that you're not gonna get from any intensity metric just pinned on the hurricane itself. Um, what about kinetic energy? A lot of people, this was proposed, I believe actually in 2006. Uh, so this kind of gets at the overall energy of the hurricane wind field. Um, and so we can see in this case on the left is Camille, on the right is Katrina. Katrina is about twice the integrated kinetic energy of Camille. So while Camille was a five, Katrina was a three, you could argue from an integrated kinetic energy perspective that Katrina posed more of a threat. But um, we said, let's look at this. And so this is a paper we published a couple of years ago. 
So we look at the relationship between wind and damage, and we see kind of what we've already shown, that it works better with pressure. We also looked at it with integrated kinetic energy, and it's about the same as it is with, um, with wind. So pressure works better than Ike as well. And so, you know, I work with Dan Shavas at Purdue and some other colleagues as well, trying to kind of get at this a little bit more. And Dan's um, a great scientist and really good at the math stuff, which isn't always my, my realm of expertise. But I thought what was interesting is we use his kind of um, example hurricane vortex. So here on the x-axis is r over r max, so one being the radius of max wind. And we look at basically how the wind field is weighed by these different quantities. So we're looking at DP, which is the pressure deficit, which is basically what we've been talking about. We have integrated kinetic energy, which is the blue line. And then the dotted, um, the dotted um, blue line is power dissipation, which is basically the same as Ike, but cute. And we look at the, how basically the wind field is weighed with the pressure deficit. Because it's proportional to the centrifugal force in Coriolis, basically what you find is that you know, it mac be the wind field decays basically exponentially as you go outside of R max, whereas you see Ike tends to have kind of a fat tail, so it tends to overemphasize a bit the outer winds. And we can see that if you calculate the Ike of Katrina, which is 120 terajoules versus Sandy, which is 360 terajoules. And so while people in New York would say Hurricane Sandy is the worst hurricane that's ever hit anywhere, I would argue, you know, obviously Sandy was bad, but certainly Katrina posed more of a threat than that. So I think given the way that pressure is, pressure deficit, it really does work really well as a hurricane metric, and it's much easier to measure um, as well. So with that, I will um, take any additional questions, and thanks so much for having me. fascinating talks, and I'll be happy to take questions. Um, hi, Phil. Hey. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess, if we were to change the hurricane scale to focus on pressure, how would that affect the public perception of some of the forecasts that we would be issuing? Yeah, and so that's one of the, so one of the challenges that we have right now is the Hurricane Center um, measures pressure in real time, they but they don't forecast it. However, they do forecast VMAX, they forecast 34 knot wind radii, and they forecast latitude. And I work with Dan Shavas and a couple other colleagues, and we have a paper that's just about accepted that basically says you can take those three forecast quantities that you already have and basically spit out pressure. Um, so I think really the key is to start by getting them to forecast pressure, um, and then we can maybe go to the categorization by pressure. Um, I think, you know, it's hard. People say, well, people don't understand pressure, but I'm like, I don't think people really understand wind either because, you know, the max sustained wind in a hurricane, very few people on land are going to experience that, if any, given how it's an over open water. And we talked about this earlier, how within a few blocks of the coast, the winds decay really, really rapidly, and it becomes a lot more gusts than the sustained winds. Um, so I think by doing a one to five scale based on pressure, you will also get at, you'll still get at the intensity of the storm because of the way the pressure field is weighed, but you also then get at more what the storm surge impacts and the size impacts are going to be. So I think you can still kind of keep the same kind of intensity metric. So I don't think it necessarily will confuse people a ton because you'll see like, you know, if it's a category three or four, it's going to have likely a much larger storm surge associated with it as well. Because I think the emphasis is so much on wind, but when we look at the big damage from storms, Wind is some of the damage, but a lot of the damage is actually more the storm surge and the rainfall, especially as we build better construction in places like Florida. You know, if we look at, say, Hurricane Ian, there was a ton of surge damage, but you look at the new, there's a lot of new construction in that area, held up really well because it's built to those, and we know how to build for wind, but if we build in, you know, three feet above sea level and you have a 12-foot storm surge, that's where your problems lie. So I think really... I, I think just having a one to five scale is probably really what the public would need. It would obviously require some education, but I think at the end of the day, you know, storms like, I always go back to Hurricane Ike in 2008, because it, it was a category three by our pressure scale, a category two by wind, and there were a lot of people I think that stayed on the Bolivar Peninsula and probably died because they said, I'll leave if it's a major hurricane. And it had a 16, 18 foot storm surge in the Bolivar Peninsula. So I think there's also an issue with Sometimes people call hurricanes minor hurricanes. It's like there's no such thing as a minor hurricane. Um, but yeah, I think by doing pressure, we'll probably get better at some of these impacts. So we'll see if anything ever happens, but we'll kind of at least try to keep working at this from various aspects to so hopefully try to convert more and more people to team pressure. <laughs>
Um, do you see the change happening in your lifetime? <laughs> uh, I think, honestly, what would need to happen is we need a large hurricane. I think if we get a category, like a 90 knot, 950 millibar hurricane, then I think you might see some changes happening. But I think that's really what it, most of the hurricanes in recent years have been pretty close to like the typical wind pressure relationship. We haven't had a, an enormous hurricane. Um, the one that was interesting and still flummoxes me to this day is, what the heck about Ian versus Charlie? I didn't mention Ian. How on earth were these two storms the same wind and pressure at landfall? That I don't know. I've talked with the Hurricane Center about it. Um, they actually just did a, um, a blog on Ian talking about how Ian size was so important. I'm like, well, well, how is it not in the pressure? And you could argue because really what we're looking at is pressure deficit as opposed to pressure. But yeah, the pressure was higher, but that's really far north of Ian. And so if you look at environmental pressures, depending on how you define them, there's not a lot of variability in that quantity. So I kind of hand waved a little bit that maybe it was a bit environmental pressure, but there may be some other stuff going on too. I just, I, I just, this thing still flummoxes me as to how those two can be the same. And they were both very well measured storms. It's not like one was satellite and one was aircraft. Um, you know, maybe there's, if maybe Charlie's winds were a bit stronger and Ian's were a bit lower or something along those lines. But it, that to me is, I, I think it's still, pressure is still not, doesn't tell, doesn't tell us all. Ian was also strange because the strongest winds were on the west side of the storm, which is weird for a storm going from southwest to, to northeast. There was some really weird baroclinic interactions with Ian, which is odd, especially for a September hurricane in Florida. Um, so that's still indicates to me, like, I would have, in my dream world, Ian would have been the poster child, like, you know, I don't know, 130 mile an hour winds and a pressure of 935. Because if we put this in Dan Chavas's pressure gradient model, this should have, Ian's pressure should have been like 930. Um, but it wasn't. And so it's trying to figure out kind of what, what goes on there. So there are still some other dynamics that can come in as well. But I do think in the answer to your question, you know, a large hurricane, I think, would be what might get stuff moving. Um, but we'll see. I don't know. I, I think there's there's just oftentimes anytime. And this would be a big thing if you're changing this stuff. So it's not something that's going to just happen overnight. But, you know, I think if we keep kind of highlighting all the benefits that it has, you know, hopefully with time, maybe we can get more and more people on board. I know especially global models do a lot better job in general forecasting pressure than they do wind anyway. Um, and when you look at, um, invi you know, if you look at global models, I'm always just looking at the, most people just look at the pressure fields. You don't really look at the wind fields in a global model. You look at the pressure field and you're like, okay, it's nine, 960, therefore that's a Cat 3-ish storm. Um, so I think there's other benefits as well. And we've kind of put together a list of like how many ways it's just pressure is better. Not that wind isn't important. I obviously want to know the wind field, the wind radii and all that. But I think overall, if we're going to use one number, let's use that. By the way, if there's any questions online, it's last chance. Okay. Is radar data used to get the integrated kinetic energy? So this, this integrated kinetic energy that we calculated was from the extended best track, which probably most of the extended best track wind radii data would be from scatterometry. Um, and some would be aircraft, because these are storms coming onto land. Um, so I would say radar probably not so much radar is used a lot more, I think, for the max wind at landfall. That can often be, there's a whole pile of stuff they use, but often radar may be something that they use to, like, the, to kind of pinpoint what the max winds are at the time of landfall. Because radars, you know, if, if the radars are stay active through the storm, they will use that for that. But usually most of the wind radii stuff is more from uh, aircraft, and then when it's over water, it's more from satellites. But we also found here, we use the integrated kinetic energy about a day before landfall as opposed to at landfall, and that's because you're using wind radii, and as your storm is approaching land, the wind radii will often get deformed because part of the circulation will be on land before the center of the storm crosses, so your wind radii can get a little messed up and then kind of skew your, your calculation like right at the time of landfall. All right, we are at two, but we do have uh, one online question from Casper Ammon. Uh, great presentation, thank you. I'd like to pick up on a couple of comments you made. The high temperature anomalies in the Atlantic really already point to a likely relatively higher activity level, almost independent if we get a full La Nina in fall or not in the Pacific. His question is, in the future, with higher temperatures, we generally communicate that there is a reasonable agreement that intense storms might increase, but overall number is very uncertain might actually go down. Is there increasingly a contradiction? 
<laughs> uh, well, let's see. How much longer? No. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, when we look at it from a longer term scale, it's 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 ocean temperatures, but it's also more like potential intensity. So because as we warm the oceans, we also warm throughout the atmosphere and we warm more higher up in the atmosphere. So we look at potential intensity. If you just plot the same trends, potential intensity will go up, but it's not nearly as much as sea surface temperatures because we're warming the upper troposphere. Um, so that can kind of mess with stuff a bit. To me, really the biggest question that we have and stuff that we really don't know well is, is the future going to be more El Nino-like or La Nina-like? The climate models mostly say El Nino-like, which may mean the Atlantic quote unquote loses. Whereas if the climate is more La Nina-like, the Atlantic may win. But if we're looking, say, for intense storms, if we're looking at overall numbers of intense storms and you knock down the Pacific in a more La Nina-like future, you're going to knock down your overall um, number of storms and also your cap four or five, just because even if you amp the Atlantic to the max, it can't keep up with the Pacific. So if you want to see a crazy number of cat four or fives, you want a monster El Nino. Basically, you want to amp the Pacific as much as possible. And who cares what the Atlantic does? Because it's a it's like 15% of global storm activity. So to me, that is a really big question. I think, yes, in the future, probably storms will get a bit stronger. Exactly how much stronger, we don't really know. The number, I think, I think it's getting fairly convincing that that number has gone down a bit, how much more it will go down. I don't know. I still feel like we've really kind of struggled to even know exactly what drives the overall number of storms in a year. There's a lot of theories that have been proposed, but I don't think we really have like a great answer for that yet. In general, in La Nina years, you tend to have fewer global storms just because you knock down the Pacific, and the Pacific is a bigger driver of the global number of storms, especially when you eliminate these short-lived storms where we have this kind of big increasing trend in recent years, especially in the Atlantic and the Eastern North Pacific. If you get rid of those, you do see, you actually do see fewer storms globally in La Nina years. Um, so I expect this year, Atlantic up, Pacific way down, globally way down for number of storms. Um, the Atlantic, the Northern Hemisphere right now, we've had three storms, which is the fewest since 1977, which was like the year of no storms in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't think that's going to be the case this year, but the Atlantic just can't drive the, uh, the global ace bus or the global storm bus. All right. Thank you. Let's uh, thank our speaker again. He'll probably stick around for a little while yet if you have any other questions. But thanks again. Thanks.